Hi, welcome. My name is Miguel Jimenez. I'm the founder and director of the Lit and Loose Festival Book Club. Thank you for being with us here tonight. And thank you to our co-presenter for tonight's event, the Los Angeles Review of Books. If you're not familiar with them, check them out. For rigorous, incisive, and engaging writing in every aspect of literature, culture, and arts. Um, there will be an interactive chat after I talk with Professor Sanchez Prado. So get your questions ready to post, uh, or go ahead and do so now. You can post them on the chat uh, next to the screen here. Um, one note about translation for tonight's event. Si desea escuchar la traducción al español en vivo de este evento, simplemente haga clic en la liga que aparece en la descripción del video del evento en YouTube. Eh, si él tiene alguna pregunta acerca de la literatura mexicana, si le gustaría recibir recomendaciones de libros, habrá oportunidad de hacer preguntas en vivo a través del chat, así que simplemente tiene que poner la, su pregunta en el chat al lado de aquí en YouTube. Um, tonight's event is What Do You Know About Mexican Literature? And I'm really excited to have this conversation uh, with Professor Sanchez Prado because there has been so much uh, in terms of publication of uh, translated Mexican uh, works by Mexican authors, uh, but not much conversation uh, as accessible or public uh, as we're able to have um, today. So I'm really, really excited to have this conversation. So uh, let me first introduce to you uh, our special guest today. Ignacio M. Sanchez Prado is Jarvis Thurston and Mona Van Dyne Professor in Humanities at Washington University in St. Louis. His research focuses on Mexican cultural institutions with a focus on literature, cinema, and gastronomy. He is the author and editor of various books on these topics, including Strategic Occidentalism on Mexican Fiction, the Neoliberal Book Market, and the Questions of World Literature, and a History of Mexican Literature. His public writing has appeared in the Washington Post, Los Angeles Review, Los Angeles Review of Books, Words Without Borders, and other publications. He is the editor of two series, SUNY Series in Latin American Cinema at SUNY Press, and Critical Mexican Studies at Vanderbilt University Press. Without further ado, I want to welcome uh, Professor Ignacio M. Sanchez Prado. Thank you very much for having me, and thank you to you to make to, to the Los Angeles Review of Books for, uh, for their hospitality. Thank you, Ignacio. There's so much to talk about tonight, uh, and so I'm, I'm really excited, as I was just saying. Um, so much happening with Mexican literature in the past few years. Um, so there's a lot of talk about a little bit about the boom uh, or what we're seeing as, as this literary, uh, tr this translation boom. Um, the authors behind it, uh, trailblazing women authors are also a part of this. The publishing industry, translation itself, Mexicanidad, in quotes, her Mexicanness. Um, but I want to start with with a, with a something funny that, that happened actually. And I think it's an important distinction um, you know, I invited some friends uh, for this event through email. Um, people replied and they said, yeah, you should, oh, this sounds interesting. And one of the replies said, oh, Mexican literature, like Sandra Cisneros. And I laughed a little bit, you know, because uh, we're, we're, we're here to talk about Mexican literature from Mexico, not Mexican American, as, this, as my friend here thought. Um, so I'm wondering if you could Talk a little bit about that distinction uh, before we get started talking about Mexican literature. The little the distinction between Mexican American literature and, and Mexican literature, and and the significance of both. So I'm wondering if you could we could start with that. So I think we have to understand that whenever we speak about the Mexican community, we're talking about those two communities that are related, and that we should stand together in in our politics and our culture but that we have different experiences. Uh, there is one that largely speaks of those of us who grew up in Mexico or who, the, the people who live in Mexico, right? And in terms of literature, we're speaking of a literature over there that is written in Spanish, maybe in indigenous languages. Uh, it is available in English only through translation. Its original place of publication is Mexico or Spain or another Spanish speaking country. And then there is a literature written 
by Mexican Americans and Chicanx uh, 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 people in the United States. It's a literature that can be in Spanish and is also predominantly in English, though a published origin in the United States. And I make this distinction not because we are not the same people, but I make this distinction because these traditions sometimes don't really read each other. And in particular, as someone who is from Mexico, I always have to begin with the recognition that those of us who were educated in Mexico do not know enough about the culture and the writing of our Mexican American uh, people. Um, so my expertise is in the literature from Mexico the literature written in English by Mexican Americans is something that I know I'm in, and I'm interested as a general reader, but I do not carry expertise. And I want to make sure that my voice as, a, as an specialist on Mexico does not erase the culture of Mexican Americans or that I do not pretend to be an expert whenever we have very, really great experts on Mexican American culture who could speak about this with more authority than me. So I, I wanted to, to make sure that this is clear. Uh, at the same time, these categories are uh, dissolving because we have many writers who formed themselves in Mexico and now live in the U.S. and sometimes write in English. This is the case of someone like Valeria Luiselli, who, who wrote her latest book in English, lives in, in New York, but really doesn't belong to the tradition of Chicano literature because she does not identify or with that or has that historical experience. So that's why these distinctions are important because we have to understand that Mexican culture is binational, it is diverse, it has socioeconomic differences, it has racial differences, and we have to be attentive to not have a homogeneous idea of, of Mexican literature. Yeah, and that's that's one of the reasons I was really, really excited to, to, to talk with you about it, because I'm a Mexican-American that reads Mexican literature and wants to understand a little bit more about it you know and i think uh, a lot of the viewers here do too and so and it's it's uh, one of the one of the questions i often get about mexican literature and this recent you know boom of translation is mm -hmm. how did this happen um you know we have a a, a book club with the lit and loose festival and you there's always one or two people that say wait how did all these books get translated within the past few years i think people are really and when they and when they mention uh, the, uh, these authors that have been translated, they're talking about Guadalupe Netel or Valeria Luiselli, mm -hmm. Ana Enrique, um, most recently Fernanda Melchor, and um, so they're they're talking about these authors and they ask, you know, how did this happen? How did this literary translation boom happen? And I think a lot of people are more familiar with magical realism, um, a little bit maybe now with El Crack and Los Craqueros. Um, how would you sort of where would you where would where would you say the the root of this? And I, I know there's many, and we're going to explore all of them today. Uh, but what's one of the roots of the the literary boom that we see uh, that we're seeing today? Is it rooted in the the crack, or uh, what, what what would you say? So I think that there are three different phenomena that are come together. I think one is uh, the juggernaut success of Roberto Bolaño, like a decade and a half ago or so. Uh, this created the possibility of understanding Latin American literature in a way that was different from, from magical realism and the legacy of people like Garcia Marquez, right? And it opened the space for other writers from Latin America in general to come in. And one of the important ones that is specific to Mexico is that one of the first ones to do the live was Valeria Luiselli, who became very, very successful with the story of the Misientes or the story of my teeth. It's a translation that was unusually successful for the way in which it was done. And this has created a space of interest by readers that are demanding more and more diverse Mexican books in translation. But this is only one part. And I think people focus on this explanation and they miss a couple other in interesting parts. I think that there was a, the crack group, which is a group of, Five, uh, five or six writers, depending who you ask, from the 1990s. Two of them were my professors, so I know the story from the inside. They really came in with a manifesto and a group of books that where they really wanted to make sure that Mexicans were not pigeonholed into writing about Mexicanness and magical realism. Some of their more, most famous books are about the Nazis and Europe and the World War. Um, but what they did, I mean, they don't have as much resonance in English as they should, but what they did is that they, they were part of a generation of Latin American writers that really claimed the idea 
that you can write about anything if you're Latin America and not just about your authenticity, yourself, your identity. And that diversified, that contributed to diversify the kinds of things that people outside Latin America were willing to read on Latin America. And the third one that I think is more important is that translation booms are labor and they require people who are invested in it. We have a brilliant generation of translators who have a, people like Christina McSweeney, like Lisa Dillman, Sarah Booker, Robin Myers, a George Henson, and many others that have really invested themselves in re getting to know Mexican literature, pitching it to publishers, advocating for it, writing about it, doing very high quality translations to come to the US. And there's also a group of editors like uh, Will Evans at Deep Bellum is one that I know well and I, whose work I really admire. There's people in some university presses, there's presses like Coffee House Press uh, that have really spent the resources in embedding for Mexican literature, even though there wasn't really much guarantee that it was going to sell because some of the older writers have been translated, but the books never really may achieve the level of resonance that they are achieving right now. So it's the three things. is the Bolaño effect, the, uh, the presence of a new generation of translators and editors, and the change in the idea of Latin American literature from the 19th forward. Yeah, and, and, I've, and I also read in, in, in your book the, mm -hmm. um, that, that there was also trailblazing women behind what we're seeing, that there's a gender dynamic to the, this translation boom uh, yes. And it includes writers like Cristina Rivera Garza or mm -hmm. Carmen Bullosa. Can you talk a little bit about the role that they played in, in this as well? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the biggest commercial successes in literature in Latin America were women in the late 1980s. The two most well-known writers are Laura Esquivel and Isabel Allende. But they wrote very much on the mold of magical realism. And this younger generation of uh, women writers that rose in the 90s, the ones that I write about, Carmen Boyosa, Cristina Rivera Garza, who just won a MacArthur Fellowship, by the way, mm -hmm. um, they really wanted the right to not be writing for this kind of a stereotypically feminized, stereotypically magical realist literature. And they, they wanted to make sure that the position, their position as women writers while aware of gender questions, did not limit themselves uh, to, to be just pursued for stereotypical narratives and things like that. And it, this was a, a continental process. If you look at Latin American literature today from any country, I think it is unquestionable that there is many more women, right, emerging women writers in the lead of, of Latin American literature than men. And this is the case of Mexico, this is the case of Argentina, this is the case of Ecuador. This is not to say that they're not men, male writers, and we're going to talk about some of them too. But the, the level of presence and importance of women in Latin American literature today is unprecedented. And this was created in part in the 1990s, and these are some of the trailblazers that are leading Mexican literature into translation. And I think we have mentioned already three or four. Cristina Rivera Garza, Valeria Luceli, Fernanda Melchor, Guadalupe Netel, they're certainly at the forefront of, of literary writing in, in Mexico. Yeah, and part of that, as you were saying, was because there was, they were resisting this pigeonholing mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. that, that was these expectations that were put on, on, on women and, and Mexicans to write a certain uh, specific kind of writing. Um, mm -hmm. I get a lot of questions from people, you know, when they, when they tell, when we talk about literary translation and Mexican authors, and sometimes those questions are questioning uh, who is being published in, mm -hmm. or who is being published in the U.S. or who is being translated. Um, and sometimes there's this argument that they're saying, well, well, a lot of these writers mm -hmm. uh, are not writing about Mexico, you know? Um, mm -hmm. And they almost say it in a in a in a negative way, right? And so there, as if there's this sort of like expectation that they should be writing about Mexico. Um, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about uh, about that, about the res the Mexican literature, because to me it seems like it, it makes Mexican literature a little bit special. That that there's this resistance to being pigeonholed. Can you talk a little bit more about that? 
one, I mean, one thing that we have to, to, to remember, there is no literature in the world where people only write about themselves. A literature where that happened wouldn't be a very good literature. You have to write about yourself, but you also have to write about the world. There's a worldwide world outside. A minority writers from ethnic and racial minorities, as well as writers from what we now call global South countries, from Latin America, from Africa, a, are always expected to only write about themselves. And this is a form of marginalization because it fails to recognize the complexity and the diversity of the culture and the complexity and the diversity of the literature of both these countries and these, and these groups. Certainly, I would like to hear more about African-Americans writing about the Black experience in the political context where we live more, where we live this is important. But I would like African-American writers to write about Europe. I would like African-American writers to write about Native American culture. And I would like Native American writers to write about all of that and Mexican writers to write about all of that. That's the wealth, that's the wealth of, the, of the literature. It's the ability to interpret the world from a, from a specific cultural perspectives. So what I would tell to readers that say that is, look for both. There are good writers, Mexican writers, that will show you aspects about Mexico. And there are also good writers uh, that will give you a cosmopolitan perspective. And the richness of Mexican literature is that we have both. Yeah, and I was I was saying to you earlier that, that some people say, you know, uh, that, that there is... For example, Roberto Bolaño, who's Chilean, wrote about the Mexican border pretty well, you know, and, and a lot of people really like how he wrote about the Mexican border. Um, earlier, you, you mentioned Bolaño, too. So it, it, when I was preparing this conversation for us, I was rethinking and or thinking about uh, an essay that Horacio Castellano Moya wrote in La Nación sobre el mito Bolaño, and I think mm -hmm. it was translated... Uh, into Bolaño Inc. by uh, Robert Paird and Wes Enzina in uh, in Guernica, and um, and in that in that essay, Horacio Castellano Moya, uh, Salvadoran and Honduran writer, uh, argues that that there was this myth that was created by publishers, this Bolaño myth created by publishers, um, so that they could sell his work in the United States, mm -hmm. uh, translate it and sell it. Um, and he goes on to, you know, talk a little bit about U.S. cultural imperialism and this sort of American arrogance um, that it, that he argues is, is is exists because Americans feel like they that they're, a writer exists once they discover them. I'm wondering if you're if you're seeing that happen today. Are, are you seeing uh, Mexican authors being packaged in a way, or do you get the sense that there's this American arrogance? there any translation that happens through private publishing is a is a, is a commodity and it's going to be packaged i don't i don't necessarily get caught on that question very much i think that the the important part of that debate that uh, horacio castellanos developed in dialogue with the scholar called sara Pollack in in the college of staten island is more that the editorial world centralizes in one author it was Garcia Marquez back in the day. Now it was Roberto Bolaño then. And then they forget about everything else, right? Mm -hmm. Like it is as if it, there is this tendency that, for example, everybody pays attention to Elena Ferrante and nobody reads any other Italian author whatsoever, right? <laughs> so that is that is the, the core of that complaint at the time. We live in a slightly different moment because even though we have authors that have become predominant, like Valeria Luiselli for Mexico, there is far more diversity of Mexican writers that are getting press coverage and, and distribution and attention from the presses than was the case when Bolaño was, was uh, rising at the time. See what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I don't know that it's the same problem that we have now. I don't know that you can say that Valeria Luiselli is taking the air out of all Mexican literature the way Bolaño's uh, juggernaut figure was back then. But I, I do think that the problem is that this is a, a literary culture that is notable for reading a very low percentage of translations in general. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, if you go to a bookstore in Mexico, what we call literatura universal, so world literature, that would be two thirds of the bookstore. 
And in here, it's just a little, like very low percentage of books in between the fiction section. Mm -hmm. uh, people in the United States like to read stuff that is written in English. And therefore, any other culture that comes from the outside is, is inherently marginalized by the translation system. And because there's very little space, people tend to blow up out of proportion a handful of authors at the expense of, of representing the diversity of writing around the world. Yeah, and I'm and I'm curious because earlier you mentioned uh, small publishers. Mm -hmm. um, it seems to me that it's the small publishers that are the ones sort of putting forward a lot of the the writers. You know, I mean, you have Aleta Ricelli with a larger publisher, but then you have mm -hmm. other authors. Uh, for example, with Coffee House Press, um, I think you mentioned them earlier. One of my one of my favorite books was Veronica Gerber Vicetti's. Mm -hmm. um, book that uh, came out with Coffee House Press. I'm wondering if you could talk about, yeah, publishers and, and what is their role in this? I mean, Valeria came out in Coffee House Press. That's right. First. That's right. Yeah, that's, uh -huh. And then she got the contract for a bigger press. I, I think that the problem is that corporate publishers, it's a, it's a vicious circle, right? Corporate publishers have standards of sale that are very high. Um, and for them, publishing translation is riskier whenever you, don't ha you have a reading audience that doesn't like to read translations. Uh, so it has been up to uh, smaller publishers to take on the risk because they can't, their, their economic model allows them to do things like selling less copies, right? Um, I don't think you can say there's a boom of Mexican literature in Penguin Random House or in Simon & Schuster because there's only like a couple of writers that actually show up in there. It is in Coffee House, in the Bellum, right? And in other press, like, and other stories, like presses like that, that are really the ones that are carrying the water for the translation of Mexican literature. One of my favorite cases is Will Evans from, he's in Dallas, Texas. He was the owner of the press, Deep Bellum. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite editors in the United States. Translated Jorge Vol, oh no, Jorge Vol, no, Sergio Pitol. Sergio Pitol, right? He's, he's the translator, Sergio Pitol, and he trans translated over. He, his press de bellum trans, is, publishes literature in translation. And now the most recent development is they bought Dalki Archive, which is a very major mm. publisher of literature in translation. And there is a model of a press that is really investing itself very, very significantly just on translation. And that is, that is new and it's pretty remarkable because it's not really a business model that has been, uh, that has been put forward. But you have cases like Dorothy, a publishing company that is done by my colleagues in Washington University, Daniel Dutton and Martin Riker. They are the translators of Christ some of Cristina Rivera Garza's work. And they have this model where they put two women writers that do some kind of experimental prose writing every year. And they have they do a lot of American writers, but they have also been doing translation. Um, and that's the kind of model that we like to see more. And the independent publishers are the ones that are taking those risks. They are not enabling the monolingualism of the American reading public. They really want to put forward the diversity of the world in front of the readers. And that, that is a meritorious uh, a pursuit. Yeah, you, you know, we're talking about translation, and, I, and I, I'm, I'm thinking about also some of the... Um, readers that, that might think, oh, it's, it's impossible to translate Mexican Spanish, you know, uh, but I, I've been lucky to have conversations with, and with, uh, she's a friend of the festival, Christina McSweeney, who you mentioned earlier, yeah. and the, the, the process that they undergo, or someone like Christina McSweeney undergoes to, to translate is very rigorous. Uh, I'm wondering if you could talk about uh, your experience reading translations uh, and, and the, the challenge that that, 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 that is, but um, the, the result of translating Mexican Spanish into English. Translation is always a compromise because there are untranslatable elements of one language to others, right? At the same time, I don't think that, that you're like failing to represent the authenticity of a literature or anything like that with translation. Most translators are very thoughtful and they think very long and hard about every decision that are made, they make. I mean, George Henson, if you follow his Twitter, he's mm -hmm. the translator of Sergio Pitol. Sergio Pitol's novels are very idiomatic and he sometimes asks like, how would you translate this, right? 
I'm struggling with this passage. Can you give me some versions of how would you bring this into English? And you can see in his translations because there are great renderings of Sergio Pitol, but tra people misunderstand translation as being literal. But translation is a process of transformation of the writing for it to convey the same sense of style and, and content into the English language, but it doesn't have to say every single word that is said in Spanish. The translation that Sophie Hughes did of Fernanda Melchor, yeah. which is a very slangy book, is great. Does it translate every word in the in hurricane season? No, it doesn't have to, but it really captures the force of the prose, and that's really the important thing. So yeah. I, I and, and the other thing that I would say is that whenever people dismiss translation, they are becoming provincialists, right? Because then what follows is, oh, I'm just going to read stuff written in English. And by doing so, you're marginalizing more than if you, than you marginalize if you, if you read translations. Yeah. For me, you have to default on inclusion. Yeah, and, and, and again, the, the sort of labor, and I think you used that word earlier too, about the labor of translation. It's really mm -hmm. hard work. And it's one, as you were saying, uh, with Josh Henson or, uh, or Sophie Hughes right now, where um, they're in constant communication with some of these authors that are living, you know, and like, like Fernanda yeah. Mechor. I know Sophie Hughes and Fernanda Mechor were going back and forth and, yeah. and, and checking little words. And, and, and the, I think the other thing is that Fernanda Melchor, for example, also speaks English, you know, so they're able to, to help each other in that process of trying to capture as much as possible what Fernanda was trying to, to write in her novel. I mean, but it doesn't even have to believe in writers. Uh, there's a recent translation where Sophie Hughes was uh, a translator of Jose Revueltas' is The Hole that was published by New Directions. This is an astonishingly difficult book to, to translate. And it, it's a great translation. Mm. It doesn't have to have the author's collaboration. It just has to have a translator with a good sense of language. And for me, what we have now that we didn't have maybe 25 years ago is a group of translators that have raised the level of translation of Mexican literature. And if you look at a lot, there are some translations of classic Mexican works from the 60s or the 70s, and you can see that the quality of the translation today is much better. Yeah, and, and, and talking about that, there's a lot of writers who haven't been translated mm -hmm. that are me Mexican writers that haven't been translated. Sergio Pitol was one of them at the time, right? Yes. Uh, who was, so I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the, the importance of Sergio Pitol, because Sergio Pitol was the <laughs> translator himself, right? Um, yeah. So I'm wondering so, if you could talk a little bit about Sergio Pitol. So, let's, so to understand what happened with Sergio Pitol, you have to understand two small things. The first one is what we talked about. People want Mexicans to write Mexicanness, right? And the other one is that the United States is the country next door to Mexico, but it doesn't really care very much about Mexican culture. Most Americans that I, I have encountered, not of course the, the audience members of a, of a broadcast like this one, because you are interested in Mexico, you come to something like this, but the average American, even the reading public, and even some of my well-educated academic colleagues, they don't know the first thing about Mexico. So if you think about those two phenomena together, what happens with a writer like Sergio Pitoli is, there's a first hordo, which is that very few Mexican writers break through that wall of indifference to, towards Mexico. And once they do, they have to break through about the expectation that it's about Mexicanness or nothing, right? Mm -hmm. So Sergio Pitol was the same generation as Carlos Fuentes. Carlos Fuentes gets translated because he writes Mexican, stuff that can, you can identify as Mexicanness. But Sergio Pitol writes about Eastern Europe because he was a diplomat and he traveled all around the world. He writes, uh, he translates Russian and, and Eastern European and British literature. His books reflect that those influences. He writes diaries that are very cosmopolitan. And for many, many years, that was just not readable for, for an audience in the United States that has stereotypes about Mexico. Now, if you go to Mexico, I think that you will find an, a near unanimous opinion a bit by the crack, for example, or people like Valeria Lucelia and Alvaro Enrique and other writers, mm -hmm. that they find in Sergio Pitol someone who was their teacher and a big influence in the writing because of the cosmopolitan aspect. So if you, th if you expect things about Mexican literature that do not correspond to what Mexican writers are doing, mm 
what happens is that the translation falsifies the, the, the image of Mexican literature because you're not translating what is being written or what is important, but whatever fits the cultural stereotypes of, of the United States. Mm. And Sergio Pitol was a victim of that. Now, it is very paradoxical that his translations are so important that there's a series at the University Press of the Universidad de Veracruzana just devoted to his translations because they're very important and they're very good. And he wasn't translated into English for years and years and years and years, right? So that's the kind of uneven attention that we get. Uh, most literary readers in Mexico are very knowledgeable about American literature, but most literary readers in the U.S. are not knowledgeable about Mexican literature. That's true. <laughs> That's why I was so excited to talk with you today. And so I'm wondering now, is there, are there authors that haven't been translated that you think is like it's well overdue, they should be translated? Some of them, and some of them have to be retranslated because the translations are not very good and they're out of print. I think that in general, you can say that with Mexican women writers from the 20th century need to be translated. Mm. There are cases like Elena Garro or Nelly Campobello that were translated back in the day, but the translations need revision and they need to be published in a more visible venue. And there are other cases, you know, there's a series called Vindictas that is translating, that is republishing women writers from Latin America that are not, that did not receive the attention they deserve. And you can see writers like Maria Luisa Puga, who's a great novelist, mm. that has very, very little presence in English, and she wrote some really great books that even Mexicans did not read until very recently because of gender marginalization. Mm -hmm. It's hard for me to say which ones haven't been translated or not because part of the problem is that whenever they have been translated, no one paid attention to the translations. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, for instance, if you look at the crack writers, some of their books broke through, but these are writers that wrote 30, 40 books each, right? So my, I'm going to speak of a personal connection because my mentor Pedro Angel Palo who was one of the writers of the crack he's a very very well known writer in Mexico he wrote his crack novels that are more cosmopolitan more recently he has written biographical novels of Emiliano Zapata and Pancho Villa mm -hmm. and neither one of the two kinds of novels get translated so this is a writer that has in a major publisher publishes his books on the regular to the point that there's a Pedro Angel Palau library that publishes his backlist who has never been able to get his, his work translated into English for some reason. Yeah, so, and I, I, mm. so what I want to say is it's not necessarily advocating you should translate X or Y, but just to point out that what gets translated is, is uneven mm. because it really relies not in the project by process of translating Mexican literature organically, but on the brave everyday ground roots work of translators who develop a relationship with some writers and then bring them to the presses. But I don't think there's a lot of scouting of writers in Mexico for the presses. That's that was that was a question I was thinking as you were saying this is what's holding what's keeping a, you know translators or translation away from these authors? Is it the lack of scouting then? Yeah, the lack of scouting, the lack of knowledge. Uh, the fact that I, I don't know because I know it's a matter of agents and translators, but a lot of this stuff is pitched, mm. or it's not necessarily sought by the by 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 some publishers. Uh, and at the same time, you know, they're translating very exciting contemporary writers that you can bring into literary festivals. You can have talks with them. Translating back from the 20th century is a more complicated proposition. The translations are harder, but also you don't have an author to parade around literary festivals, right? They don't have an agent. So all those kinds of things, uh, it really requires someone to do a, an effort that is not being done to bring those writers into the present. And it's being done in, in cases like the translation of Jose Revueltas that I mentioned, but it needs to be done more. I think that there is almost an ethical and a political need to have a good body of, of historical Mexican literature available to, to American readers, in my mind. Perfect. And I, and I think that that brings us perfectly to a question that, that I had. And in the in your book, you mentioned in the introduction, you mentioned that one of your objectives is to connect readers interested in Mexican literature to to authors works. Um, yes. um, so there's that's one of the questions that we we received a lot from uh, from our, our viewers today. 
uh, where there are questions about recommendations. Um, so I'm wondering if you can give us maybe a few recommendations. We mentioned a few, a few names today, um, but I'm wondering if, if you could give us some recommendations. Uh, there's a, maybe we could start there and then I'll, I'll ask you the other questions. And, and to remind everybody, if you have a question, feel free to put it in the chat. Um, si tiene alguna pregunta, la puede hacer a través del chat. Um, so I'm wondering if, if there's some works that stand out for you that which have been translated that, that you would recommend. I mean, since the Los, since the Los Angeles Review Books is our co-host here, <laughs> I have published some reviews of some works through them. A, a favorite one is the work of Julian Herbert, who's a great poet and and prose writer. There are two non-fiction books. One is called Thompson, that is a memoir. And the other one that is my favorite of his books called The House of Someone Else's Pain. Uh, both of them translated by Christina McSweeney. Uh, and this one is about the massacre of Chinese, a massacre of Chinese citizens during the Mexican Revolution. And also the process of Julian researching the, the massacre. Those are great books. Um, and through Great Wolf Press, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, to Grego, Grego Press is speaking about independent presses that are investing the resources on, on translation and, in the, and Latin American writers. Mm -hmm. um, I always recommend Sergio Pitol because he's a writer very close to my heart. Uh, he has, what you can find in English now is the trilogy of memory, which are three hybrid texts about his memoirs as a diplomat and as a reader. And uh, now you can also find his short stories, which are incredible. And I know George Henson is translating his major trilogy of novels and that in the process of being published. But if you look at Deep Bellum Press, you will be able to find all of his work, the one that has been published and the one that is forthcoming. I mentioned that there's women writers in the map and there's a lot of them. Mm -hmm. Certainly the one that I, has acquired a lot of visibility is Cristina Rivera Garza. I am the editor of one of her books through my series in Vanderbilt called The Restless Dead. Uh, but she has uh, some of her novels, like the Iliac Crest, came in English, came into English recently. And she also has a book called Grieving, uh, that is really one of the finest books about the question of violence and, and death in Mexico today in the context of the drug war. Mm. Um, there are, so there are, uh, uh, there are those kinds of writers. Another writer that I like a lot, and I reviewed her for the LARB, was Yasmina Barrera. Mm -hmm. It's a very fine essayist. The book they translated of her, and that was Christina too, by the way, Max Sweeney, is On Lighthouses, mm -hmm. which is an essay of trips to six different lighthouses in, in Britain, North America. And that is a great example of someone that is not writing about Mexico at all, but really shows an, a great talent as a writer. And I, I would invite people who want to consider books that are not about Mexico to, to read this particular book. It was published by Two Lines Press, Two Lines Press. Uh, out of the center of translation. So you can see, again, these are more independent groups that are bringing the most important works into, into English. Yeah, so yeah, we had these questions that were, I, th I think there's one, that's, I, I think it says uh, that are in conversation when, with Daniel Sada, says here, but I think they mean that Daniel Saldaña, uh, Paris. Yes. Um, so someone asked for recommendations of authors and books that are in conversation with his kind of work. I mean, Daniel Saldaña is an emerging writer, right? He has written two, three books. Mm -hmm. So I think that more than people who have been influenced by Daniel, you you can look at people that are publishing more or less at the same time and in the same place. If you like Daniel Saldaña, I think Guadalupe Nettel is a very good writer to, to study and Laya Jufresa. I'm looking in, a, in, in the chat that we have with the backstage that Daniel Sada, right? Who was the very famous writer from the border. Okay. Uh, Daniel Sada is another one of those writers because he's very, very untranslatable. Uh, he passed away. Um, but Daniel Sada, who I had the chance to meet in Mexico many years ago in college, he was very influential in the development of the literature of Northern Mexico and of border writers. His most important work, which is a 700-page novel, is not translated into English, and I would say that this would be the time to do it. But it would take, it's, it's a titanic effort, because he writes on a very Baroque and complex style. But I think that if you see writers like Elmer Mendoza, eh, who's just starting to come into English, those would be the disciples 
of Daniel Sada. I think the problem with the Northern Mexican literature, besides its marginalization, is just that they run on a very, very vernacular prose, and it is a more daunting task to translate. So I think those are books that are going to be coming in future years. But they, a, a lot of what is translated is still very much centered in Mexico City. Mm. And, and, and to that point there, you know, we're getting some comments on the chat that says, Preach, thank you for the point on marginalization, marginalizing that happens when you're provincial uh, about reading translation. Um, thank you for the important points of marginalization. Um, and there's a question here, if you can talk a little bit about Mexican poetry in translation. Well, that is a, that is a more difficult thing to find. And the reason why is because poetry sells less Translating poetry requires a very high level of expertise. So that combination is very difficult. I am aware of two contemporary poets translated by Carbor House Press, a very great Mexican poet. One is Alejandro Tarraf, mm. and the other one is uh, Marisela Guerrero. Uh, those are books that are very worth looking uh, for. But I would certainly expect and even ask publishers and translators to pay more attention to poetry. Mexican poetry is excellent. And there's a lot of great books that are published every year, but very little of it gets translated because most of the translations are centered on fiction first and then maybe on narrative nonfiction, but poetry is still very invisible. But I would begin with Alejandro Tarrar. He's one of my favorite poets, and Marisela Guerrero, who's also a wonderful poet. Mm. There's, a, there's a question here. Uh, there's a comment that says, Necesitamos más antologías bilingües como Best of Contemporary Mexican Fiction. Yeah. Um, uh, we need more anthology or bilingual anthologies like Best of Contemporary yeah. Mexican Fiction. Yeah, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, Nacho? Well, I mean, I will say this. This is one of the largest Spanish-speaking countries in the world, the U.S. And it is enormously difficult and expensive to find literature in Spanish. You had to import it, right? I had to buy, I get a package from Spain every two months and one from Mexico for me just to keep up. Mm. It's very expensive, right? And I can do it because I have a privileged job that allows me to afford that. Um, it is not available to readers who are who know who are either Spanish speakers themselves or who have learned Spanish through through their education. You just can find the books and the the presses that publish in Spanish, like Vintage Español. I think they could do a better job uh, bringing literature rather than just publishing commercial books. Um, you can find books of, by, if you look at, at a Spanish section in, a, in many bookstores, mm -hmm. you can find a Spanish translations of Stephen King, but you cannot find major Latin American writers. That's true. <laughs> and that is ridiculous, right? At the same time, I agree on the bilingual editions because I think there's so many people who have access to Spanish that I think it would be a point of inclusion to have more bilingual books that allow people to read in either language that they domain, command, but also if you read some Spanish, like my students, and you uh, you need some help with the, a little bit of the translation, that would that is a great resource. And there are some novels that are published like that, like Carlos Fuentes' Saura was published like that. Mm -hmm. I think we need more of that for sure. Okay, there's a question that's coming in about, who are some contemporary queer Mexican writers that you would highlight? I mean, that's an interesting question because there are not very many in translation. Mm -hmm. uh, there's one I like a lot that is yet to be translated. His name is Eduardo Montagner Anguiano. He's a writer from Puebla. Uh, his uh, book is called Toda Esa Gran Verdad. But actually, the question is really highlighting that, that uh, that's uh, still something that has to be translated more deliberately. Um, some of the ones that I like a lot, Karen Villeda, right, who's a, who's a well-known lesbian poet, she's still to make, about to make it into English. I, I may be blanking on, on some writers that are available, but I don't think that if you look at the ones that are at the forefront of the market, eh, I don't think that queer writers are in that forefront. I can think, for example, Literal Publishing House in Houston, which publishes bilingual books. They have a book of Criseida Santos Guevara that is a, a, a really good queer writer. Uh, but that's something that really needs more method to, of translation. And I think that it is not in the forefront of, of what is being translated, which speaks about the marginalization of both queer and trans voices in translation, which is something that needs to be discussed more. Mm 
Um, there is a comment question here. ¿Dónde estudiar bien la literatura mexicana sin nacionalismos? ¿Mejor quedarse en México o salir a una universidad extranjera en Estados Unidos o saltar el charco a Europa? Um, so where, where can we study Mexican uh, literature without nationalism? Uh, stay in Mexico or go, uh, go to um, outside, of the, outside of Mexico? The choice that I made in my many years ago was to come to the U.S., But actually, where I studied uh, Latin American literature, there was no professor of Mexican literature. So my Mexican part was self-trained. Uh, the professor that was here came later. His name is Joshua Long, but he didn't really work on contemporary fiction. Um, I would say that you, if you want to pursue it as an academic uh, degree, you can do it anywhere, right? We have the internet and we have great people all over those academies. I think that the expectation of nationalism is not an expectation that scholars have. It is an expectation that certain that subsets of readers and subsets of publishers have. But most people who, who are academics and scholars and critics of Mexican literature default to the idea that the nationalism is no longer the framework to, to study Mexican literature. I don't think you will find a professor in a university that will tell you that nationalism is the way to go. Mm. There is a question coming in about poetry, back to poetry. Um, they're asking uh, Luis, I think that is Favre or Luis Felipe Favre, maybe? Yes. And he's a, he will be a queer writer also, Luis Felipe Favre. Mm -hmm. I, is he, I don't know that he, he might be translated and I just don't know, but um, Luis I, Felipe Favre is one of the leading poets in Mexico. He has a poetry book that got a lot of visibility called something like uh, Cuentos de Horror of the Mysterio or something like Historias de Horror of the Mysterio. It's very good. I'm just blanking on the title. He also has a really great novel that came out recently on St. John of the Cross that will be worth translating. So yeah, I would totally advocate for Luis Felipe to be translated into English. I admire him very much. I just am not aware that he is, but I might be wrong because again, there are so many coming out that sometimes I don't find out that things come out like until later. But if, if he's available, definitely go with him because he's one of the best ones. Yeah, and I might be wrong, but I think he is being translated. He might be, yeah. Yeah. I don't know that anything is out, but I'm sure that it's coming. Because yeah. he's also very, he's very well, he's very visible in Mexico, so. Mm -hmm. um, let me see, let me make sure that I have asked the questions that have been coming in. Uh, ah, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about nonfiction writing in translation from Mexico? So there's more of that. Some of the books I mentioned belong to that, like Jasmina Barrera and mm -hmm. uh, Rise on Fiction. They, they have someone else, else's pain, although it's marketed as a novel. It's actually more of a, it's more of a history book and a chronicle and a, and a, and a gonzo journalism book than, than a fictional no work. Um, We are, there's some work by Carlos Monsiváis, who's historically the, the most important writer of Chronicle in Mexico, available in English. So it's like, and Cristina Rivera Garza, her nonfiction is available too. And those will be good writers to start. Uh, there's also a subset of writing that is more journalistic and that deals with the drug war. And you mm -hmm. can find some of the work of people like, like uh, Anabel Hernandez, uh, published by presses like Verso. Um, but, you know, it's one of those things, essays are, very, uh, there's essays and there's memoirs and there's chronicles. I think memoir-oriented books are more common, although it's not really a very common genre in Mexico as it is in English. Mm -hmm. uh, people, people don't have this sense of self in Mexico the same way that I think American writers do. I mean, that would be a, a good question as to why that happens. But the memoir is not a central of a genre in Mexico as it is in the U.S. And The essay is more, the essay, like people writing essays about something that is not themselves, that is more common, but that doesn't make it to translation as often. Yeah, that would be chronicas, right? Or... No, 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 not only chronicas. Chronicas and ensayos are different. Chronicas yeah. are more texts that derive from journalism, reporting, and sort of the account, narrative accounting of everyday life. And essays can be, you know, there's a one that came out by Luis Yamara mm. that is a, it's about wigs, wigs like the wigs that you put in your head. Mm -hmm. It's just an essay about wigs. Mm 
the history of wigs, the, the important wigs in, in, in cultural history. And that's a different genre that doesn't make it into English very much. There is a, a comment, I think, here is, I would like to see how the success of Mexican Gothic by Silvia Moreno-Garcia paints a picture where Mexican authors can focus on genres outside of what the market expects of Mexican authors. Well, but actually this happens. And one thing that I was say, Silvia Moreno-Garcia, I don't know how many people realize that she's Canadian. Uh -huh. This book was written in English. I love the book. I, I would recommend it to everyone. It, I, there are two things I can say as a Mexican reading this book uh, from a Mexico-Canadian writer. The first one is that she has a beautiful, beautiful set of references to Mexican culture. A lot of that book in particular is based on the cinema of a Gothic filmmaker from the 60s called Tawada, Carlos Enrique Tawada. And she makes direct reference to Tawada in, in this. I think most English language readers would miss the reference because he's not a filmmaker known outside of Mexico. But another filmmaker, another person that is very influenced by Tawad is Guillermo del Toro. Mm. Um, and she has been involved with David Bowles, uh, who's, you know, someone that was involved in the controversy against uh, American Dirt. They have been involved in the translation and editing of a Gothic book by a writer called Jose Luis Zarate. Mm -hmm. The book is called the, the Route of Ice and Salt, and it is a vampire novel. I believe it's from the 90s, and it just came out in English very recently. And I think that because there are things like Mexican Gothic uh, moving Mexican right to that direction, that opens the space for the translation of a writer like Zarate. Zarate was marginalized in Mexico, too, because it wasn't considered that this kind of genre writing wasn't considered to be intellectual enough. And now you can find the route of ice and salt in uh, in English, and it's a book I really recommend. It's a really wonderful novel. Mm. There is a, we only have a few time for just a few more questions here, so I'm gonna I'm gonna mention that there is a comment here about Salvador Novo's P Pillar of Salt is in translation. Yes, it is. Thank you, thank you for whoever pointed that. Salvador yeah. Novo is, is the great. He's the great queer writer of the 20th century, mm -hmm. and the Pillar of Salt is his memoir. And if I'm not, I may be mistaken, but it was either translated or, or somehow edited by my friend Michael Schussler, who's a, who's a scholar, an American scholar of Mexican literature who teaches and lives in Mexico. And Michael did a lot of work with The Pillar of Salt. So, no, yes, for the person who wanted that recommendation, that's definitely a great book to go to. So thank you to whoever uh, brought it to our attention. Let's see. Um, a ver. We'll do two more questions here. Let's see. Uh, if we have some time, can Nacho talk about some books uh, in other media, like film, now that we've gone in that direction of film? Books on... I don't really understand the, yeah. exactly the question. Talk about books in other media, like film. Maybe books about film? I'm not sure. I mean, there's films. I, I, my, half, half of my career has, has been about okay. literature and half has been about cinema. And we have, a, we have a complicated problem there because it's the same problem with foreign cinema. There's a lot about by Mexican directors who have migrated into English language filmmaking, like González Iñárri, Toro del Toro. But very few Mexican films made in Mexico come to the U.S. for the very same reason why subtitle films don't come to the U.S. People in the U.S. don't like to read subtitles. And the distribution system is very, very centered on, on American cinema. Uh, but, you know, there's a few things out there there's a there's a film that I don't love myself, but many people do love called uh, He's No Longer There, that is in Netflix right now, that has gone in a lot of accolades in Mexico. And, you know, we go Roma. Roma, Roma is a peculiar thing that would merit its own podcast. <laughs> a whole uh, a whole hour. A whole other podcast, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, that, that was the question. I misread it, but it was, yeah, if you could talk about film. Um, yeah, film is more, film is difficult. I mean, I, I own a collection of 2,000 Mexican DVDs mm. because it's the only way to watch most Mexican cinema. The streaming platforms have nothing. No, you, If you try to find the golden age of Mexican cinema in streaming, it doesn't exist in the U.S. It's absolutely really, it's absolutely shameful on mm. the media companies that they don't that they don't distribute this material that is very meaningful to so many Mexicans. Yeah, so many good films. Uh, and you know what? Let's let's end on this question uh, from from someone in the chat here. Uh, 
What is the last book that you have enjoyed, either in Spanish or translated? Ah, that's a good question because, <laughs> you know, I'm a professional reader, so there's a lot that I read that I don't enjoy. I just read a book by a Mexican writer who, I mean, it's a Mexican writer that really defies stereotype because his name is Alan Paul Mallard. He lives in, he lives in Paris. I believe he still lives in Paris. And the book is a, is a travel narrative that he did in Bolivia with a Dutch artist. The book is called Altiplano. It's very good. I hope it makes it to English because I, I know that Alan Paul Mallard's, uh, in, in Spanish it's called Evocación de Matías Timberg. I don't really know exactly what title it's going to get in English, but his it's, it's publication in English is coming very soon. Um, I really love that book. It's a, it's a wonderful short novel. Uh, and, you know, there's something that I read in... Um, in translation recently, but that's a classic book. The Italian writer Antonio Tabucchi was one of my favorite writers from the world. The uh, Anagrama in Barcelona just published his complete short stories in Spanish, and I just like love them, and I read them two or three times. Mm -hmm. And because I, I have to say, I also have favorite American writers mm -hmm. that are not necessarily Mexican or Mexican-American. I really love this writer who's uh, of Persian descent, her name is Asarin van der Villet Olumi, and she has a novel called Call Me Sibra that is probably the novel that I love the most last year. Mm. Um, and she has a new novel forthcoming that I'm actually, I just got the, the advanced copy to write a review about it. But, you know, is that, that is me telling my, my the, the listeners that even though I'm Mexican and I'm a scholar of Mexican literature, I read non-Mexican stuff. And it's very liberating and very important for me to not be pigeonholed to just do Mexican stuff. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. That natural. Well, before, before you close, I want to say yes. one more thing because I want to make sure it doesn't get erased. Yes. Indigenous Mexican literature is not very available, but there's one book that you can get now called Red Ants in Deep Bellum, and that's uh, translated from Zapotec, and I would recommend people to look for it. This one right here. Yes, that one right there. Yeah, Red Ants. Um, wonderful. Thank you so much, Nacho. Uh, if people want to continue to, to know about recommendations and what you're publishing, uh, can they follow you on, on social media? Or Yes, I, I'm on Twitter as I Sanchez Prado. Okay. You will get a combination of screenshots of films that I watch, the stuff about literature and pictures of my dog, okay. and the stuff that I cook, and the stuff that I cook. A little so bit. I'm a, I mean, I'm annoying on social media, but if people are interested, my, my Twitter is public. Well, a little bit of everything from cinema to food, from pictures of your dog. No, no, we have to do, we have to do everything, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, Nacho, for, for your time and for all the, the wonderful conversation that we had today. Thank you so much. Thank you. I want to also thank uh, Johnny Barra at Q4 Media for tonight's live, live stream. Uh, thank you to Jaime Garza of Los Santos for the opening music, Flotando by Alma Fuerte, his solo project. Um, for additional book recommendations, check out the book list from Lit and Loose contributors on litandloose.org. Um, recently assembled by Make and Turn Maya Burris of DePaul University. Uh, again, that's litloose.org. Uh, the Lit Loose book club takes place this summer. I'm really excited about it. Um, an announcement of our full lineup is coming soon. Uh, maybe some of the, the names that Nacho mentioned are going to be in there. I can't tell you yet, but uh, there's going to be a few that were mentioned tonight for sure. Um, and we can do, I can share our, our first selection. Uh, uh, it's going to be a title by Daniel Borzuski, written after a massacre in the year 2018, out from Coffeehouse Press, who we, we talked about today. Um, we're excited to announce that our 2021 Chicago Lit and Loose Festival is going to take place November 1st through the 6th. It's going to be a hybrid festival with online and in-person events. And this year's host of our live magazine show is the University of Chicago's Logan Center for the Arts. Uh, so to learn more about our festival and the participants and the programs, uh, please sign up for our newsletter and follow us on social media. Links uh, will be or are in the chat. So follow us there for all of our updates. Um, one last thank you to Nacho. And one last thank you to everyone who, uh, for your questions, for your comments, and for spending uh, this time with us. Until next time, uh, have a good night. Thank you. <laughs>